Hey y'all, another Monday is here and I just horsed around with a few photos of uh, break stories and things I've photographed and everything. And I was looking through my files and I had quite a few little things and a, little, so a, few, a few of these will be a little bit of a review. And I got some stories to add to them and all that, but uh, uh, to begin with, you know, Pascal's Law is something that we uh, were required as automotive instructors to teach. Uh, and basically, you know, you snake some brake lines to from the master cylinder to the uh, wheel cylinder, and you're you're going to have less area here than you do there. So you're multiplying that. You might notice you're actually multiplying the um, the, the pressure that you're putting on the master cylinder with that. All right, watch that again. Fluid pressure and movement. When you see that, whenever that pushes down, this only moves a fourth as far, but it moves with four times the force. So, in addition to this multiplication, the fulcrum, the way your pedal is set with its hinge, you've got the pedal um, hinged up at the top, and right there under the hinge, you've basically got it going into the master cylinder, and that long part coming down to the pedal multiplies it that much more. Of course, even when you got your power brakes with your power brake booster that's using the atmospheric pressure to help you apply the brakes, it gives you even more. See, so you've got plenty of power to stop that vehicle. Now, if you want to check your uh, brake fluid for moisture, you can take a uh, voltmeter and hook it from ground. I like to use that one over by the alternator or anywhere like that or even a battery. And then I go and dip this in the fluid and I'm going to read that voltage there. And if that voltage reads more than 0 0.030, it's got moisture in the fluid. Now there's also these Phoenix Systems test strips you can buy. They cost about a dollar a piece, and I think there's a box of 70 of them. And it, it stands for, it's their FASCAR, F-A-S-C-A-R, and that stands for Fluid Analysis by Stimulation of Copper Alpha Reactions. Because copper uh, becomes a problem in brake fluid. You know, copper in and of itself tends to be kind of corrosive. And so as copper becomes a part of the brake fluid because, it, you know, elements in the brake system have copper in them, brake lines particularly on the inside, some of them and, uh, come from other places, that copper, if it gets to where there's too much copper in the brake fluid, you know, the brake fluid, we all know it gets dark over time. But when you dip that thing in there, you look at the various shades of purple and you compare it to the least a dip strip is what it is. And I taught my students how to do that when I was teaching automotive. Never, interestingly enough, we never paid a lot of attention to this kind of stuff when I was working in the field. You know, so you can basically get into any area of automotive and you can dig as deep as you want to and find out all kinds of stuff. We basically just, you know, put on shoes and pads and built cylinders and fixed brake fluid leaks and all that. Uh, but, you know, some of your uh, oil change places want to change the brake fluid, but most of the time there's not any, uh, except on Teslas and stuff like that, there's not any regular brake fluid change uh, intervals. Uh, you know, and most of the time we don't look at the brake fluid as long as it's, you know, it'll be a dark color. You know, as long as there's nothing leaking and everything in the brake pedal feels okay, we don't pay a lot of attention to that. But whenever I'm uh, bleeding the brakes, what I like to do is get four bottles uh, and I'll take a hole, I'll drill a hole in the bottle cap so that the hose fits tight as it slides through that hole and then I drill a little vent hole next to it. And then I'm talking about the plain old water bottles. And then I tie some wire around the neck of it so I can hang the bottle and I put that hose on the bleeder and listen and just open all the bleeders. Now granted you're going to have to do some special procedures on some of them that have ABS, you're going to have to have a scan tool connected to run the pump on some of them, this kind of thing, and you need to make sure you, you know, you bleed them according to that. Now uh, I talked on a previous one about how, you know, on this one uh, 08 Nissan pickup truck, the uh, body shop didn't bleed them in the right order and they wound up with a brake pedal that never felt right until we actually went in there and bled them in the right order and straightened that out. I mean, that guy drove the thing six months with a brake pedal not feeling right, so that air didn't work itself out of there. Now, you can open all the bleeders, and sometimes all of that fluid will come, I mean, all that air will work itself out of there, and, the, and they'll, you know, if you just put all those on there, make sure the brake, fluid, brake fluid's full and let it drip. Uh, you can, sometimes the air will work itself out just automatically gravity feeding, but that don't, or gravity bleeding, that doesn't typically help uh, on every car. However, what you can do is you can loosen all of those bleeders and have, and keep it full of fluid. You know, I talked about taking this uh, bottle and 
filling it up with fluid and turning it upside down, setting it into the top of the master cylinder so that it'll feed the fluid down there automatically like a chicken house waterer. And that gives you a lot more capacity in your master cylinder than having to lower the car and pour it in there all the time. Uh, but anyway, you keep working it, you'll get all that air out. you got to remember, when you're bleeding brakes, though, you may have a big air bubble that's working its way through the system, and you're still squeezing that, even though you got uh, clear fluid coming out of the bleeder. And so you'll know when that brake fluid... And also, you can bleed the brakes without the engine running, and the pedal may feel just fine, and then whenever you fire up the vehicle, and that extra uh, brake booster action will make the pedal go too low. You know, So you'll know by the pedal travel if it feels right. And again, if you don't have the rear brakes, if it's got drum brakes on it, if they're not adjusted right, like if they're not adjusted out really close to the drum, you're going to wind up with a brake pedal that you hit it once and it goes too far, and you hit it the second time and it catches it close to the top. And so it's real easy to think you're done with the rear brakes when you're actually you're not. And I've actually done brakes before when I fell something. I said, well, no, that's not right. I know there's no air in it because all I did was replace the rear shoes. And then I adjust the rear shoes out where they're really tight and close to the drum without actually slowing the drum down and then I got a good tight pedal. So there's a lot of little nuances on this. It's a whole lot easier. Than, I mean there's a whole lot more to it than just swapping out the parts. You got to know how to make all your adjustments particularly on drum brakes. Now these are flares. This right here, this plain old single flare, this is only good for low pressure applications. It's not really strong enough for brakes because you got about 2,000 pounds of pressure in your brake line so you need to do the double flare and that basically what the double flare does, just in a word, is you start out by making a bubble flare and then you use your pointy end of your uh, tool, you know, that jacks it down to turn that, that into this. But this bubble flare is, uh, repairs, re requires a special tool to make that bubble and then they've also got this bubble right here that looks like a mushroom flare. This is just a standard bubble flare. That's a mushroom flare. And you can see the vehicles that these right here typically appear on. And I've seen these on domestic and Asian. I've actually seen these on domestic cars. But that's fairly common on Asian Euro vehicles. Now, this right here, you notice the forming tool is this thing right here. This particular kit comes from Harbor Freight. And it only costs about $60. But it's pretty robust the way it's made. And you know, you know, you might notice this is chamfered right here on the where the line goes through, and they got them little grooves in there where it bites the line. Now, you got to tighten that up. I had to tell my students, don't stick a screwdriver in between these because that's potted metal. If you stick a screwdriver in between there and try to tighten those up, you'll bust one of those ears off, and then you render the thing unusable. But these little adapters right here are made for doing bubble flares, and these are made for doing double flares. And so you once you basically take the thickness of this. See that thickness right there? That thickness is how you, you put that next to the line and you bring it out until the this is as high up as the thickness of that tool. Now that tool is a little thicker than what it actually looks like in the real world. But whenever you use that thickness for your gauge as to how far that line needs to stick up through there and then you tighten this down really good, you got to snug it down if you're working with steel line. you got to bite it really, really, really hard or when you first do this, it'll just push that line back. So if you don't have that bit tight enough, you're going to have trouble. Well, anyway, when, once you've made that bubble, see we've made a bubble right there, and then we follow up with the pointy end here, and that gives us our double flare. And that double flare actually seals against that uh, inside of that uh, wheel cylinder or, or whatever you're going into with that. Uh, you, and see this right here is for bubble, and that right there uh, is for a double flare. So they, it comes with all of those. That is a pretty darn good kit right there for 60 bucks. And whether you like Harbor Freight or whether you don't, uh, this is good stuff right here. And like I say, you know, you can get a lot of, uh, this will pay for itself before long if you do any of that. A lot of times people go through a whole lot of uh, trouble and won't ever do any kind of uh, flare, uh, brake line flaring at all. I taught my students how to do it. This one girl went to work at the Ford place over there in the parts room and the parts guys knew, I mean, the mechanics out there needed to build a brake line and they didn't know how to do a double flare because they'd never been taught that and never had to do it before. And a lot of those guys had a lot, of, a lot of time in the field. I thought that was really interesting. So she called me on the phone to give me, so I could give her a refresher over the phone to tell her, you know, so she could tell those guys how to do a double flare. Because she had done it, but she had just forgot. It's easy to forget that stuff. Now the bubble flaring kit, this one here is just for bubble flaring. You know, each one of these is for a different size line. And you notice how that's chamfered a little bit? I mean, it's made, I say it's tapered. This is tapered a little bit. And when you look at those closer, 
and that's what makes this bubble flare. That's a bubble flare. That's a double flare. Okay, and you can't. They're not interchangeable. The fittings aren't interchangeable. The nuts aren't interchangeable. You notice that nut has got a place for that double flare to fit. This right here is basically the the bubble flare. It's got a different kind of nut that goes against it and all that. And this looks similar to this, but it's different. See, that makes a sort of a bubble, but not like not the right shape. And see how that, this is what does that. That tool is right here. And it actually goes on the end of, of your uh, thing right there. But long and the short of it is bubble and double. You need to know which one you're doing and you need to be able to do it the right way. It's not a bad idea to practice that. Now this brake line right here was on a 2500 series, uh, actually on a Duramax. And the uh, welding instructor came over there and he goes, my truck needs a master cylinder, I think. So I said, well... All right then, he had had a shop one time a long time ago, so I felt like he sort of knew what he was talking about. So we popped him a master cylinder on because that's what he said he wanted done. That didn't fix it. Well, we noticed that when the pedal was going down, there's fluid dripping from under the truck in this rusty brake line. Remember, this brake line's got to hold about 2,000 pounds of pressure, and this wasn't even on a vehicle for salt roads, but it was coming from back here. Now, behind the picture, it was back there close to the rear axle assembly. And you notice how... They've got this one right here up running so that they didn't want to run it like, well, forward on some of theirs will, uh, would run the line inside the frame down there close to the bottom. And when that dirt piles up around it, it, got, it just holds moisture next to it and it, and it just rusts it out something awful. Well, see, Chevy was trying to do a better job, but the material that they used, you know, in Volkswagen used to run theirs and the Volkswagen Rabbits back in the 80s and late 70s, they'd run the brake lines under the carpet. And you let the, leave the window down a time or two, or if the windshield starts leaking, the carpet stays wet all the time, the brake lines start to rust. And I've actually had a brake line fail on one of those. Uh, when I was at the Volkswagen dealer uh, back in the 80s, we had uh, recall where we were supposed to replace the brake lines on any of them that had too much rust under there. And, uh, of course, a lot of the times the guys that didn't want to fully replace the brake line would just scratch some of the rust off, say, no, nah, yeah, I ain't put it all back together. And, uh, but anyhow, the point is that rust right there is really, really a nasty problem because it, it compromises the ability of that line to hold that 2,000 pounds of pressure that can be going back there when you're doing a panic stop. Now, this line right here is that you can buy, you can buy a roll of this from Amazon in the 316th size for like $33. It's real expensive if you buy it at a parts house. But this is nickel and copper mix and it's made for brakes. It's strong enough to hold it, but this line is very easy to bend. It's very easy to flare. It's very easy to work with. And I love that line. Just about everybody uses that line to replace this older steel line. Furthermore, if you've ever had any of this steel line and you've tried to double flare any of it, you can, you know, it's very, very, very tough to double flare some of this brake line. I mean, I taught my students to do it, but it was rough. Interesting to me, though, these lines right here, say, that were for fuel, were made of something else, and they didn't rust, but that one did. You know, it seems to me like this line here is a whole lot more important than those lines, and they could have done better. Now, one of the reasons they make these brake lines so small is because there's so many pounds per square inch, and if you've got a lot of square inches, the line's got to be that much thicker. But if the line is really small, you still get the hydraulic action, but the, a small line can handle more pressure than a big line. The bigger the line is, the thicker the metal's got to be to handle the pressure. Uh, and anyway, but this line right here, you can buy that. This is that copper nickel uh, alloy line. It's very easy to work with. I mean, always remember that because that's really good stuff. All right, now these pads, are when they're compa you notice this is two different calipers. This caliper here had the uh, caliper feed going in there, and this one here's a different one. That's a rear caliper, if I remember right. See how the fluid's coming in from the back? Anyway, both of these had the same problem. Somebody kept driving them until the pads were completely gone, and they had started grinding the rotors away, and finally the, the caliper piston came out far enough to where it actually, on that one, the piston came out to where it, you know, cocked crooked and started leaking. Uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that we see whenever somebody just keeps driving because people have a tendency, if the noise just starts and gets slowly louder, then they just keep ignoring it and figuring they'll do something about it sooner or later and then eventually they find, you know, wind up with some pretty serious brake failure. But the way the systems are set up now, even if the rear brakes fail completely, the front ones usually stop the car even though your pedal don't quite feel right. I heard this one funny story about this guy back in the, uh, I don't know, early 60s or whatever. He came, this guy was running a filling station and it was late at night and this guy came just driving right into the lift, on the lift and he said, hey, I got a, a blown wheel cylinder, I need to fix this. And that guy said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I'll show you how to fix this. So 
what the guy did was he jacks the car up on the lift and he goes to the wheel cylinder is leaking and beats the line flat so no fluid can go to the wheel cylinder. And when he went to back the vehicle out, uh, he couldn't stop and he went off down in the ditch and the filling station uh, technician came running down there and said, what happened? And he says, well, he says, I don't know what happened because all the rest of the times I did this, it worked just fine. So he had done it four times and he didn't have any brakes going to the wheels at all. And that last time he was stopping on one wheel. This one here had to have a new caliper or a new piston and seals. This, see, these other pistons are phenolic. See those phenolic pistons? Uh, although that one may have been a metal piston. It's hard to tell from here and I don't remember. But the long and the short of it is I used to see these phenolic pistons swell and the caliper would stick. Now the caliper is less likely to stick with one like this unless there's a lot of rust in there. But you can see the corrosion I'm talking about here. And, and that copper that gets in the fluid kind of helps corrode the darn thing. Copper and moisture together. You know, so anyway, that uh, right there, you just get rid of that piston. You could buy caliper pistons and you can get a caliper kit and, and you can rebuild the calipers if you want to. But calipers don't usually cost that much anyhow. And it's best just to go ahead and get another caliper and give that other one back to them for a core. Um, this is not the worst I've ever seen. <clears throat> but you can see how it was worn down to the point to where the vent ribs are showing. I mean, this was like paper thin right here because somebody just kept on driving it. You know, that's something that people do so much is they keep driving these things. And of course, this one here has also got the, uh, this is one of those hats. It's got some par park brakes around on the inside. Now, this is one of the worst ones I've seen right here where it machined it completely off. That was brilliant. Uh, anyway, this is right here makes you want to take the vehicle back there behind the shop on the steam cleaner slab and pull the jacket up, put a stand under it, pull the wheel and the brake drum off and steam clean that or, or pressure wash it to get all that dirt and crud out of there so you don't have to deal with that whenever you're trying to work with it. Incidentally, if these brakes have got a lot of dry dust on them, you don't blow that off with air because breathing that is like smoking a thousand packs of cigarettes and it's not nearly as much fun. So you, you don't want no mesothelioma taking over you. So you put a pan under here and you do it with something wet. You rinse it off with something, you know, some kind of brake parts cleaner works for that or whatever. We'll wash all of that off with something so the dust doesn't float in the air and get in your lungs. That's, but this right here is not brake dust, it's just pure old mud. Uh, now you might notice anytime you've got the adjuster up here at the top and it's anchored at the bottom, solid, this right here is what you call leading trailing brakes. And the ones that uh, is not anchored solid at the bottom and the adjuster down at the bottom, those are duo servo, what we call those. I didn't show you a diagram, but who cares on that? I, you've seen it before. This right here is a completely shot uh, park brake. You know, when you're doing brakes on one that's got this hat park brake, particularly on one of these GMs, you need to pop that thing off and look and see how the park brakes look. You might be able to get a little upsell and say, hey, you need park brakes too. Uh, personally, on my vehicle, I don't hardly ever use the park brakes on my Explorer. That's why when I did the rear brakes on it in a previous video, I didn't go back there and look at the, I didn't pull the rotor off and look at the hat. Uh, now, I will tell you that those uh, pads that I put on there, those Delco pads I put on there, took a while to stop making that uh, Finding Nemo noise whenever I would, you know, when I would stop, you know, I eventually stopped doing that. I was going to have Mike down there at Little Nim Tire machine the rotors, but he was booked up that day, and so I just figured I'd drive it and the little noise went away, and it's pretty much going away now. And I can't really fault the pads, although uh, you know, I've, most of the time when I've just popped a set of pads on there and the rotors were nice and thick, <laughs> I mean, it's smooth, it didn't have any problem. My son was working down there with Mike one time, and you know, typically if you've got brake pulsation, when you hit the brake and it's boom, 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 you typically, well, I got brake rotor issues, and so you machine the rotors or replace them if they're too thin to machine, and then all of that's gone. Well, my son Matt was working down there, and so, uh, he uh, machined the rotors and put, did the brakes and drove it and it still pulsated. And uh, he went in there to tell Mike, he says, that lady uh, is going to be here in about 45 minutes and these things, this thing's still pulsating, you know. And uh, when she gets here, she's not going to be happy. My, and Mike says, yeah, here we are with our pants down around our ankles. And so <laughs> they actually did the rear brakes for free just to get rid of that pulsation and all because they had misfired and assumed it was the front one, you know, without... Because usually it is. It's not usually the rear ones that are causing the pulsation, but it can. Um, now, these brake shoes right here are cheap. You know, brake shoes don't cost very much. But see how this right here, these were the riveted ones, and they're kind of, you know, busted up and coming apart and all that kind of thing. I thought that was an interesting set of brake shoes that we did there. 
This one here was long overdue. It had completely done away with all the lining, and the, the and this was eaten into the drum. And uh, so this right here is, is some of those duo servo brakes I was talking about because you notice it's got the adjuster at the bottom, and it's basically got the. But see all that dust all over them? That's the kind of dust you know to wash off with something wet so you don't blow it off with air and it's floating around. One of my students, the first time I started teaching brakes, one of my 40-something year old students that was laid off from the cotton mill, I says, do not ever blow brake dust off with your with your fingers. I mean with your, I'm sorry, with your fingers, with your air blower because it's going to float in the air and people are going to be breathing it and you don't want that. The first thing he did out in the shop was blow all that dust off with air and I never have understood why some people will nod their head and then they do what you told them exactly not to do. I like to also pull this little boot back on something like that, even if they look right. If you see more, if you see fluid really wet in there and dripping out of that boot, you're going to need a wheel filler. They don't usually cost up to eight or ten dollars on most vehicles. A lot of the times, it was not a bad idea to get a hardware kit if you could find the right one and replace those springs too. Now, one time on my Taurus, and I never use the park brake on anything I've got that's got an automatic transmission. Excuse me, maybe I should, but uh, these guys over here that I had them put the uh, put an air conditioner compressor on my 95 Taurus and one of those guys mashed the park brake when he got out of that thing and that red light on the dash that tells you the park brake's mash wasn't working and I didn't know it because I never used the park brake and so I drove that thing about 25 miles going home that night and I noticed when I was stopping at the stop sign after a long run on a country road I had no brake pedal and I, fi I figured out the park brake had been locked the whole time and it had heated the back brakes up so bad that the brake fluid was boiling in the lines and that's why my pedal had gone away and furthermore it took all the temper out of the springs on the rear brakes and so I wound up having to replace all the springs and the shoes and all that kind of stuff and the reason was because A it was a perfect storm he set the park brake I never do the guy that parked it did he was real fastidious about always making sure he set the park brake on every vehicle he parked secondly my warning light didn't work, probably because I never had used the park brake and it was kind of probably had some little corrosion on it. And then I drove the darn thing 20 miles with a park brake applied. You know, duh. Anyway, and that will get that thing really hot and it'll take the temper out of those springs and you wind up having to replace all the hardware kit and all this and it comes with this spring and that one and this one and you'll have to buy it separately but that cable that comes around with that adjuster uh, will be a, another part you get too. And then the adjuster itself sometimes will come with a kit. Now, this guy right here pressed the brake pedal with the drum off. So it's got brand new nice shoes on it. Well, he had the drum off, and for some strange reason, and this is another one of those leading trailing, because you see the adjuster's up here right under the wheel cylinder. He mashed the brake and blew the cylinder, you know. Actually, we had to take all that apart and put that back together and fix it and all that. When I was working at the... Uh, at that shop in, uh, long years ago, back in the 70s, we would actually take the wheel cylinders apart, haul them out, put new cups in them every, every single time we did a rake job. That was just part of what we did. What happened here? Look, there is no shoes left. The only thing that's still on there is that little silencer that was on the back of the pad, and it's scratching into the rotor right here. Uh, and that's just really nasty, uh, how, how, how far those brakes can be worn out before somebody ever catches that. This was on a 63 Buick, the good old days. There was no booster here. Uh, they got this master cylinder right here. It's totally dependent on the mechanical aspect of everything. This is a wiper motor, by the way. Isn't that cool? But anyway, that's the part, that's the stoplight switch right there. So whenever this pressure up and close that switch, then that would turn on your stoplights. And you see how, see the simplicity of thought that they did back in those days? Now the problem with that is over time these light right here would start coming apart and leaking kind of like an oil pressure switch does or something like that. Uh, this Explorer brake job was one of those situations where the lady comes in and she says I want the brake, brake. she actually didn't come in, she, had, she parked the thing out there and filled out the work order on the other campus over there and she says I want the brakes done on my Explorer and so can you give me a price and so I called over there and Sam, the guy at the park store, didn't ask me if it had ABS or not. He just priced me out some rotors, which were like $22 a piece or something, and I gave her that price. Well, when it came in there, it turned out the rotors weren't the right ones. The, uh, furthermore, when we, I've talked about this before, when we pulled the wheels off to look at the brakes, they were, they were haywired together and there was a bunch of missing hardware and all that kind of crap. You can't put it back out like that. So what we did, we bought a hardware kit for $25 for the front brakes, and I also had to upgrade the rotors, and you know we put all that back together. Uh, right, 
And I, I called her and I said, look, it's going to cost more than we thought because you've got any lock brakes and the guy sent me cheaper rotors and the ones with the little uh, reluctor ring, you know, were like, I don't know, it seemed like they were $50 a piece or something. They all cost almost twice as much. And so she was already upset about that. And I forgot to tell her I had to put a hardware kit on it. That was another $25. And when her daughter and her daughter's boyfriend came over there to pick the thing up, her daughter, <laughs> her daughter apparently was used to her mom's bad, uh, um, I don't know, anger issues. So she calls her up and she says, this uh, brake job is costing $275 when her, her, she really thought it was going to cost $125 or something like that. And I could hear the girl had her cell phone up to her ear and you could hear from standing five feet away her mother screaming and hollering about this, you know. But the brakes were done right. Whatever happened, her brakes were going to work right, they were done right, everything was just like it was supposed to be. But she didn't like the fact that the price was more than she expected. And she was screaming in her daughter's ear over that phone, and her daughter apparently was so used to it, she was just sitting here like that. But the daughter's boyfriend tickled me, he was standing back over there, and he was looking at me, and he had this scared look on his face. And he said, no, not good, not good. Apparently, the, he was terrified of that girl's mother. But anyway, she got her vehicle back, she paid the bill, her brakes were fixed right, we didn't haywire anything back together, we put it back there exactly like it was supposed to be. Anyway, and there's my coffee table with a bunch of, uh, incidentally, that's a different coffee pot than the one you see on my clothes outside. Now Mike over there built this homemade pressure bleeder, I've shown you that one time before, but he had an old Mustang and they worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and couldn't bleed the air out of it. It was like a 68 Mustang or something. And they did all of the procedures, and he bled. He'd been doing this business for 50 years, but he couldn't get that one to bleed. So he actually got this hose, and he used a plug up here, like you, like an old rubber freeze freeze plug, you know, like you see the ones you tighten up and gets fatter. And he put a clamp on it, and he clamped this onto the uh, top of the master cylinder. Somehow, I don't know how he did it. I don't know what your model Mustang it was, but this would fit. That's why he used that. And then he got this hose, and he bolted that in there with washers, so he could put. 25 pounds of air pressure in there, pushing on top of that fluid, put his air hose on here, use that air pressure regulator to dial that in, got about 20-25 pounds of pressure, and bled those things perfectly with his homemade brake bleeder. They got all kinds of stuff you can buy to do this, but he was basically under the gun and he kind of liked manufacturing stuff anyway, but uh, he showed me a picture of that and I thought it was really cool. Actually, he didn't show me a picture, he showed me the tool and I took a picture of it. And there I am in Nebraska in 1976 working on the brakes on the ten and a half truck. Um, when I sent this picture home to my folks, I said, here's me holding the truck up. You know, my arm is kind of covering up the, uh, the bottle jack that's behind it. And so uh, there was a problem, if I remember right, up in there that, that brake line was not screwing in there like it should. You know when you're putting a brake line in, uh, the brake line is real stiff, and it, if it's holding that nut a little crooked, it's real easy to cross thread that and make a mess out of it. And so whenever that thing is, you got to make darn sure that you bend that line, you tweak it with your wrench or whatever, so that line is perfectly straight when you're starting that brake line in there, and make sure that whenever you screw it in there, it's just like it ought to be, because if, if not, you can wipe out the threads on the nut and on the cylinder and make a whole bunch of work for yourself that you wouldn't have made if you had tweaked the line and done it the right way. Well, until next time, that's all I got for you, and I really appreciate you guys stopping by. I hope I didn't bore you with this brake thing, because everybody just about that's ever done any work has done a brake. Around here, you see a lot of people with their vehicles jacked up doing their brakes. If they don't know how to do nothing else on the car, they can slap some brake pads on it. <clears throat> this friend of mine ran a shop for years and years, and a um, little closeout story here. Um, letter carriers uh, that use their own vehicles have to replace the brakes very, very often on their vehicles. And this one guy who was the first sergeant of a local guard unit bought an unlimited mileage maintenance wear warranty for his wife's escort that she was going to use to carry mail. And so once a month for five years, he came in there and he got a full break job. And I mean, the, you know, the Oasis would print out the repair history and it would print out nearly a whole ream of paper. I mean, I mean, a roll of paper out of that machine. It was absolutely incredible uh, how many brake jobs he got. Yeah, but that, uh, I think that maintenance wear option brake thing costs like uh, $3,000 or something. 
But if you're going to have to pay for brakes all the time, you're, you know, you're money ahead doing that. And he never even got us to change the oil, but every time that doggone car needed brakes, he brought it in there and we did the brakes on it as a part of that warranty that he had bought whenever he bought his wife the car new. And uh, this service rider was always kissing up to him. And so the service rider was talking to him one day and he goes, well, uh, Mr. So-and-so, I haven't seen you for a you know, while. And he goes, oh yes, I've been in Europe. You know, the guy was all full of himself. And uh, <laughs> I was standing over at close by and I said, no, no, James, we didn't think we was going to get put brakes on that car again, you know, because he'd been gone for about six weeks. And usually it was only once a month. And the service rider said, shut up. And uh, after the customer left, I said, do you think that guy is going to take his vehicle anywhere else to get it worked on? He gets free brakes and he don't buy nothing from us. And we still, you know, we make the money because Ford pays us to put the brakes on there. Although it's not as much as a customer pay job, we get a lot of brake work out of this guy. Uh, but this other guy that owned the shop over there, he knew a letter carrier who was an older man. And about once every two or three weeks, he'd need brakes on his vehicle because they stop a lot. And so he kept having to put brakes on there. And finally, he showed this old guy. He says, here's how you jack the car up and here's how you replace the pads. And this guy bought a case of brake pads for his car, and every time he started to feel him scrub a little bit, he whipped that thing over beside the road, and he'd jack it up, and he'd pop him a set of pads on there, and that old guy got to where he could do that really fast on his own car because he had to change them about every three weeks. You know, he wouldn't go a month before he needed pads. But uh, those, that was an interesting little scenario, I thought. Anyway, I'm going to talk to you guys later, and I hope you have a good day.